Hi everyone and thanks for coming tonight. My name is Brian Gainsler and I'm an astronomer. And I love saying that I'm an astronomer because it's what I always wanted to be. And it's just a huge thrill to know that I get paid to look at stars. It's the best job ever. So I decided to become an astronomer when I was about four years old. And it happened shortly after my parents bought me this book, Album of Astronomy. I was pretty inquisitive as a kid. I had lots and lots of questions. And to shut me up, my parents bought me books because the books had answers to my questions. So I wanted to know how volcanoes worked. So my parents got me a book on volcanoes. I wanted to know uh, all about dinosaurs. And so they got me a book on dinosaurs. And when I wanted to know about space, they got me this book, The Album of Astronomy. And this book totally electrified me in a way that the other books didn't. Because the book on volcanoes answered every question I could have about volcanoes, at least as we understood it at the time. It said, this is what's going on, this is how it works, these are the answers. The book on dinosaurs told me what dinosaurs looked like, what they ate, uh, how they died, and all the rest of it. And these books are very authoritative, saying, this is how things work. This book was completely different. It said, we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> the universe is weird and wonderful and amazing and huge, and we don't understand any of it. And that just was a mind-blowing moment for me. Because growing up, uh, I thought my parents knew everything. And if for some reason they didn't know the answer to my questions, then my school teacher would probably know the answer. And if for some unimaginable reason my school teacher didn't know the answer, then you know, we didn't have the internet back then, but we had encyclopedia, and those would be in the library. And if the answer wasn't in an encyclopedia, then presumably there was someone who knew the answer, and it just hadn't been written down. But this book totally swept that perception away. It told me there were things that nobody knew the answers to. It was the first time I realized there were things that people did not know about the world. But what's more, it explained that there were these people called scientists, and in particular astronomers, and these people were in the process of figuring things out. So I had two stunning realizations. The first was, that's what I want to do. I want to figure things out, and I want to uh, have the opportunity to answer questions that nobody knows the answer to. And the other thing about me as a young kid was I hated things to end. I was easily bored. Even now, as I get closer to the end of a good book, I read slower and slower because I don't want it to end. The saddest part of a good movie to me is that moment when the credits come up and you go, oh, it's over. I don't like things that I enjoy ending. But the universe goes on forever, and there's seemingly an infinite number of things we don't understand. So my constant fear of being bored or running out of things to do, the one thing that keeps that fear at bay is astronomy. Because for every question I answer, it just creates a hundred more. I am never going to run out of things to do. So when I was four or five, uh, I decided that this was the profession for me. And I've been incredibly fortunate that uh, the opportunities have been available to me to become an astronomer and actually get to do this for a living. And even more fortunate to be able to take on young people, high school students and undergraduates and graduate students, and help them also discover their passion and their dream. So amongst the things I'm doing now is I'm part of a team that for many years has been designing uh, a new telescope called the Square Kilometre Array. And the name is pretty straightforward. It's an array of dishes that will be spread over a total collecting area of a square kilometre. And this will be the most powerful telescope ever built. And the construction on this telescope is going to start in about a couple of years. Now, the telescope actually has two parts. It has an array of what look like very fancy satellite dishes, which are spread over the desert region of South Africa. And then there's another half of the telescope that's spread over the desert regions of Australia. Why are we building this telescope that's costing a billion dollars and that's taking us 20 years to design and which is bigger than anything has been built before? Well, we're building it for a few reasons, but the main thing is we want to understand how the first stars were born. So before I talk about that question, let's start with something simpler. How are stars born? Where do stars come from? A hundred years ago, that was just a philosophical question. No one could ever know where stars come from. But we now know in incredible detail where the sun came from. The sun formed from a collapsing cloud of gas. That answer might satisfy you, but to me it doesn't satisfy me because, of course, the immediate question is, well, where did that cloud of gas come from? And the answer is that cloud of gas is the debris from 
previous generations of stars that blew themselves to bits, threw all their gas out into space, and eventually congealed into new clouds of gas. So you and I and the planet Earth and all the other planets in the solar system and the sun are made of the debris of stars that blew themselves up billions of years ago. So that's pretty awesome. But all right, where did those stars come from? Well, those stars came from collapsing clouds of gas. But where did those collapsing clouds of gas came from? Well, they came from previous stars. So you see you have a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. If the universe had been around forever, then that's not a problem. There's just always been more gas. There's always been more stars. As has been said, there are just turtles all the way down. Um, but we know that the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. And while that's many cycles of stars dying and being reborn, there has to have been the first star in the universe. And then you get the question, well, how did that star form? This telescope has been built to answer that question. The first stars formed th about 13 billion years ago. Some of those stars formed so far away from us that the light from that moment is only just getting to us now. So even though those stars formed long, long ago, and that's ancient history, we can see it happening because the light from it is just getting to us right now. The catch is, is that glow from the first stars being born is extremely faint. These are radio dishes rather than sort of telescopes with tubes and eyepieces. So instead of saying that it's really faint, think of it as a really quiet, faint hiss of static that we can reprocess to convert into pictures of the first stars. And the catch is that the signal that we're looking for is broadcasting at a frequency of about 90 megahertz. That is a terrible frequency. I don't know what the universe was thinking because it's right in the middle of the FM dial. So if you try and build a telescope in Toronto, you're not going to hear the first stars being born. You're going to hear hits 93.2. Um, so you have to go someplace, and there aren't many places left on Earth where there's no FM radio, where there are no microwave ovens, where there's no spark plugs in cars, where there's no cell phone towers, where there's nothing. And that's why we're building these telescopes in the middle of nowhere in South Africa and in Australia. These are some of the last places on Earth where you can build advanced technology, but be away from interference. And so using these very remote, very advanced telescopes, we're going to link them all together to simulate a single dish uh, many kilometers across. And we're going to pick up that faint static, that faint hiss that will allow us to construct a picture of the first stars. So right now, if you bought the 2019 version of album astronomy, it would say, we have no idea how the first stars were formed. But I guarantee you that if you come back in 10 years, that will be an answer that will be in every textbook. We'll go from complete mystery to we understand how this happened. But there'll be a dozen other new questions of things we don't even know about now, things that, uh, that we've discovered as part of this journey. So what's amazing about this book is it has all these big, big mysteries of things that in the 1970s we had no idea about. All those things are completely passe now. It's like, do black holes exist? Oh, what a great mystery. Wouldn't we like to know? Well. Um, Two black holes crashed into each other the other day and every astronomer in the world got an email about it telling exactly where in the sky it happened. Uh, so black holes, they're not passe, but they're routine. Uh, we know they exist, we find them everywhere. 30 or 40 years ago, that was one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy. But the biggest mysteries in astronomy now, things like how did the first stars form? Um, what is dark energy? What are fast radio bursts? Those were questions that didn't even make any sense 30 or 40 years ago. So not only are we answering new questions, but we're generating new mysteries as well. And that's why I love what I do. So the journey ahead for me is with the Square Kilometre Array. We're pointing our telescopes to a, a, a part of the universe that we call the Dark Ages. And our goal is to turn the lights on for the very first time. Thank you. So what is the most up-to-date answer on what is dark energy and dark matter in your experience? The most up-to-date answer on what is dark matter and dark energy is we have absolutely no idea. And if you want two instant Nobel Prizes, figure out them both for us because they're the two biggest unsolved problems. Dark matter says that 90% of the universe, of the matter in the universe, is some other type of matter. It's not atoms. The sun and the earth and everything we can see in the universe is made of electrons and neutrons and protons, the same stuff as you and me. But it turns out that most of the matter in the universe is invisible. It's some other type of particle. Maybe it's a particle that we'll detect at some point in the Large Hadron Collider. But at the moment, it's pretty embarrassing that we don't know what 90% of the universe is even made of. 
We thought that was the biggest problem in astronomy until we discovered dark energy, which despite its name is something completely different. Dark energy seems to be some sort of weird anti-gravity force which is pushing the universe apart. We've known for almost a hundred years that the universe is expanding, but what dark energy is doing is making it expand even faster and faster and faster. So that there's a huge part of the universe is some weird anti-gravity force which is pushing the universe apart and we don't know what that is. So these are two massive mysteries. I'm pretty optimistic that in the next 10 years we'll make some sort of breakthrough on dark matter, but a lot of scientists are getting very nervous about dark energy and beginning to ask a question you're never supposed to ask in science, which is, what if there are some things we can't figure out? I don't think we're quite there yet, but this has been a very persistent mystery for decades and progress is very slow. However, there are big projects, uh, including one happening in here in Canada, one I'm involved in called CHIME, which is being built to try and figure out uh, the basic properties of dark energy, which will give us a hint as to how it might actually work. But dark matter and dark energy weren't even mentioned in my album of astronomy because back then we didn't even know they were a thing and now they're two of the biggest issues in astronomy. Experiment you just mentioned is it at Snow Lab up in Sudbury? Chime? Yeah. No, Chime is in the Okanagan Valley in um, in um, uh, British Columbia, and it actually looks like four giant skateboard ramps. It looks like skateboard ramps made out of chicken wire. So it's just a big mesh and a big cylinder that runs for a hundred meters. But it turns out it looks so it looks like a piece of junk that someone just sort of threw away. But it's uh, it's a bargain. It was only fifteen million dollars, which for telescopes is really really cheap. Uh, and it turns out to be one of the most powerful telescopes on the planet. You mentioned the one kilometer array. Yeah, the square kilometer array. The square yeah. kilometer yeah. array, and it's in two locations. Is yes. that right? Yes. So which two locations again, and and why? So the dishes that were on my slide are in the Karoo Desert region of northwestern South Africa. And the, uh, the other part of the telescope I didn't show a picture of is in uh, outback Western Australia. And so the reason is actually more political than scientific is that there, after an extensive search of the entire world, everyone decided there were two ideal places you could put this telescope. Australia or South Africa, and both South Africa and Australia got very, very excited about this and promised hundreds of millions of dollars if they put it in their site. So when they came time to choose which one, they realized they were going to lose incredible amounts of money if they chose one or the other. So uh, like the wisdom of Solomon, they said, we'll just put half the telescope in one place and half in the other. It's not as silly as it sounds because um, uh, by linking up the two parts of the telescope from Australia to South Africa, you actually get even sharper vision. And uh, it, it doesn't actually... Um, it doesn't actually um, affect the quality of the data. What's more, just say you suppose you see some incredible explosion in the sky and you want to watch it flare and fade away. So the stars, like the sun, rise and set. So if you see a star rise in Australia and just before it sets, it explodes, you're going, oh no, it's, it's going below the horizon. But if you've got more telescopes in South Africa, you're, you know, you're eight hours behind and you can wait for it to rise again. So it gives you better coverage over the whole sky as well, as well as keeping both countries in the project and making sure you get maximum money to build it. Because raising a billion dollars, even with 15 or 20 countries involved, is a very challenging process. Thank you. Um,